He is Academy Professor and Professor Emeritus of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology, The Ohio State University. And he's a University Professional Fellow, or excuse me, Professoral Fellow, Charles Darwin University, Darwin North Territory, Australia, Research Associate, Northern Territory Museum in Australia as well. He is a three-time winner of Fulbright Fellowships to Australia, 1969, 1979, and 2009, lifelong learner. Author of over 85 scientific papers and nine books. Very busy gentleman. And the book we're gonna hear about today and the information he's going to share with us is Bourbon, What the Educated Drinker Should Know. He brought copies of his books in case you're interested in purchasing one. And last but not least, he has a PhD in biology from Tulane University in New Orleans. So without further ado, Dr. Tim Barrett. This is about the sixth or seventh or eighth time I've spoken here. I wonder if anyone's keeping track. But since I work on weird Australian fishes, I often get invited to talk about these crazy things. This is a total different topic. I mean, I don't know where this came from, but somehow I wrote a book about birds. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and I think you're going to learn stuff you never really knew about. What is a whiskey? Whiskey is a spirit that's made from grain, water, and yeast. That's all that goes into whiskey. Grain, water, and yeast. It's distilled to less than 190 degrees of proof, and is stored in oak containers. Now, bourbon is a whiskey. Scotch is a whiskey. Irish is a whiskey. Canadian is a whiskey. Wheat is a These are all whiskeys. So the take home message here is that all bourbon is whiskey. But not all whiskey is bourbon. <laughs> One of the first questions people ask, is bourbon or whiskey? What's the difference between bourbon and whiskey? Bourbon is a subcategory of whiskey. Okay? How do you spell whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> the Brits and the Yanks disagree. Uh, we use an E, and the United Kingdom does not. But that's a distiller's choice. There are some American distilleries who leave out the E. For example, Maker's Mark is a wonderful bourbon, and they don't put the E in it because their family was Scottish, and that was the spelling they were used to. Speaking of Maker's Mark, you, you're all probably familiar with the, uh, the wax. That's a, um, a copyright or trademark. The ladies on the assembly line, they dump the bottle in, put it on the line. Every so often, when they're strongly motivated for some reason or other, they plunge it down and bring it up. This is the result of that. <laughs> Those are called over-dipped bottles, uh, also called slam dunk. And they're very rare. Uh, but when she does that, she puts it back on the line and it goes away and gets in a box and that box gets on a truck and it goes somewhere. I found those at Kroger's in Ohio. But it's because I look all the time. Spirits are alcoholic beverages. You're used to having a variety of these things. Wine, for example, is made with fruit. And it's near brothers, brandy and cognac. They're all made with fruit. Rum is distilled from sugar cane, or molasses. Tequila is the agave plant. Gin is distilled from grain, but botanicals are added. Flowers, leaves, different parts of a plant, but especially the juniper berry. That's the main note of gin of all kinds juniper berry with other botanicals. Vodka, you make it out of anything that'll ferment. I mean, you make it out of little sneakers. It wouldn't, be, uh, it wouldn't taste any different. Uh, grain and potatoes are the, are the most common, sometimes fruit. But what happens here is that you distill this repeatedly all the way up to 190 degrees of proof. Remember we said bourbon distilled up to 160. 
the difference between 160 and 190, there are many organic molecules called congeners that remain in the bourbon that are removed in making the vodka. When you get vodka, you're getting ethanol. That's it. <laughs> ethanol and water. It's grain neutral spirits. It's nothing. It's <laughs> ethanol. And the people who argue about their vodka, well, mine costs fifty dollars and yours costs ten, so therefore mine must be better. It's ethanol. <laughs> the difference is what does the label look like? How fancy is the bottle? What is the advertising budget? That's why some are fifty dollars and some are ten dollars. <laughs> What is bourbon? This is the most important slide in the lecture. And by the way, you know where that flag came from? Perico Bay. That big flag that's always up there. I needed a flag for this part of the uh, book, and where can I find it? And it occurred to me every time I drive by, there's this huge, biggest flag I've ever seen. And I must have taken 100 pictures to get the one I really want. And all the photos in my book are, are my own photos. I learned a blue sky and a little wave to the flag and so forth. But anyway, Congress in 1964 determined that bourbon is a product of the United States. You cannot make bourbon anywhere else. You can't make it in Canada. You can't make it in Scotland. American product. Just like Scotch whiskey, it has to be made in Scotland. Then there is the Code of Federal Regulations that presents the standard of identity for bourbon. These things must obtain in order to call it bourbon. So the mash bill, which is the recipe, has to be a minimum of 51% corn. It's usually more, but it has to be 51%. Just like rye whiskey has to be at least 51%. It has to be aged in new charred oak containers. What happens when bourbon is poured out of a barrel and put into a bottle? That barrel can never be used again to make bourbon. If it is, you can't call it bourbon. It's not bourbon because it's not a new barrel. What happens to the old barrels? They're purchased by distilleries in Scotland. The reason scotch is so good is it's got a little bourbon in it. <laughs> the bourbon soaks into the wood. So on average, there's about two gallons of bourbon absorbed into the oak of the barrel. So when scotch is aging, moving in and out of the wood, it's taking that bourbon with it. That's what happens to used bourbon barrels. So you only use them once. You cannot put anything in bourbon except water in the manufacturing. You can use no color and no additives of any sort, no flavoring, nothing but water. As I mentioned, it's distilled to 160 proof. Don't go high. You're not allowed to go high. When you put it in the barrel, 125 proof. No more. You can put it in at less, and some distilleries do, because they're after a certain taste, and some of them want to put it in at 103 proof. So they're putting the water in before they put it in the bottle. Others uh, diluted at different parts of the procedure. All of these rules are enforced by the Tax and Trade Bureau. It used to be Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, part of the Treasury Department. They enforce the standards of identity so that you're not lying to the public about your label. You can make bourbon anywhere in America. Another common mistake is people think you only make bourbon in Kentucky. Not true. Anywhere in America. However, 95% of all bourbon is made in Kentucky. But it doesn't have to be. That's just the historical thing. So there's Wyoming bourbon, there's New York bourbon, there's Texas bourbon, there's bourbon from every state. Whenever you're looking at my photos and you see something like that, that's my condo down on 35th Street. That's my picnic table. Now using that white background to shoot the light up through and get the color. Photographing bottles is something I learned to do for this book and it's 
there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. It, it, it's kind of fun. Some of them are very challenging. Well, why do we make whiskey in the first place? Well, at the Revolutionary War, the British kind of clamped down on the importation of rum and molasses, so we couldn't do that. But rye, as a crop, was grown in Maryland and Pennsylvania and made into rye whiskey. In 1776, the Commonwealth of Virginia, which included all of Kentucky, offered 400 acres to settlers who would come west of the Appalachian Mountains. It's called the, the uh, Corn and Cabin Act. If you come out and build a cabin and raise corn, you get 400 acres of land to your name. That's the beginning. The soil was plentiful, the water was good. As the population expanded, more and more people came from an agrarian background where distillation was part of farming. They settled, they came from Germany and Scotland and Ireland and the distilling nations. They had this huge abundance of corn. What do you do with it? You got to get it to market. And how do you have to put it on a mule or get to a railhead and do this and that? Or you can make whiskey. You can use an awful lot of corn to make a smaller amount of whiskey, which is much more valuable than all that corn. And it doesn't perish. The rodents don't get into it. Doesn't rot or rust. Whiskey was a currency. How did bourbon get its name? Well, there are lots of stories, and this is hard to prove, but the one that I think is closest to our fact. First of all, bourbon is the name of the French royal family, the house of bourbon. And Louis the Sixteenth is the king for whom Louisville is named. And the oldest of the legends about this is that when bourbon was made in this big part of Virginia called Kentucky County or province or whatever, they would put it in barrels that they had cleaned out by firing them to remove the tobacco flavor, or the, the flour flavor, or whatever they had stored in there first. To clean the barrels, they burned them, then put the whiskey in, then put on the barrel head and stamp the contents and the county. So it said Bourbon County, and it said whiskey. So these were put on flatboats, sent down the Ohio River. They're bouncing up and down. It's sort of kinetic transport, moves the liquid around, get into the Mississippi River. They're going over rapids and falls and drops and so forth. Time it gets to New Orleans, months later, it has been shaken up and then moved in and out of that burned wood. The merchants down there on Bourbon Street liked it. This is it. You know, it wasn't wasn't white, it wasn't clear like like, like distillation that comes off the still without aging. It's it's white it's like water. Mm -hmm. We like this bourbon whiskey. Let's get some more. And that may be the way. Here is a couple of flatboat prints from uh, Courier and I. And so you can see all the barrels lined up going down this journey. What's the age requirement? To be called bourbon, how old does it have to be? There is no age requirement. If you put the distillate into a, a, char, a new charred oak bucket for a minute, you can call it bourbon. <laughs> of course, nobody does that. But the, the real operative phrase here is straight bourbon. That's the phrase you look for on a bottle. So here's a typical white label Jim Beam, very nice, ordinary bourbon. Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Yeah, that's what you look for, straight bourbon. To be a straight bourbon, it has to be aged a minimum of two years. If it's aged four years, you do not have to put the age on the bottle. So the Jim Beam is a four year product. They don't have to put any age on that. But the fact that it says straight bourbon and you don't see an age, you know it's at least four years old. The rules of naming bourbon and aging and all this and that um, tell you that whatever you put in there, you have to give the age of the youngest bourbon. So if you're making a blend of 
four-year, eight-year, 12-year-old bourbon into the one bottle, which of course will give it a different taste. You can't say that, you have to say it's got four-year-old bourbon. The youngest goes in. So when they do that, they don't often put the age on there at all. They just leave it blank. On the other hand, if you've aged it a good long time, you're very proud of that. If it's a 10-year-old bourbon, you want to tell the buyer that. So then you put the age on it. You got to read the label very carefully. That they're not allowed to be misleading, but there's a lot of nonsense on the label as well. <laughs> so, you know, here's here's a 20-year-old bourbon. Um, here's a 15. Uh, Knob Creek, a very popular brand that everybody knows. That's nine years old. Uh, <coughs> one thing about the age of bourbon, if you buy a 10-year-old bourbon and put it in your closet for 10 years and drag it out, you do not have a 20-year-old bourbon. <laughs> it's still 10 years old, because aging only happens in the barrel when it's in contact with the wood. <coughs> Read the labels carefully. For example, of um, Corner Creek there. The bottom line says, bottled by Corner Creek Distilling Company, Bardstown, Kentucky. Above that, it says, distilled, aged, and bottled in Kentucky. So you know it's a Kentucky product, but it doesn't tell you who is distilling it. They source their bourbon. They get it from another distillery and put their label on it. That doesn't mean it's bad. That's just what they're doing. Uh, if there's a state on there, that means it must be uh, distilled and fermented and aged and so forth in that state. Here's interesting. Ancient, ancient age. This is actually a, a, quite a nice, very inexpensive bourbon. It's product of Buffalo Trace Distillery, one of my favorite places on earth. And you know, they, they give you the whole smear there. They uh, distilled, aged, and bottled by Ancient Age Distilling Company. Now remember, there are two ancients in there. There's also an ancient age and an ancient ancient age. This is the one I prefer, and uh, I recommend it. If you don't want to spend a lot, still have a nice bourbon. Now, how old is that? Ah, 10 years old, got a big red ten on Carefully read the label. Ten stars. God, it has nothing to do with it. All these, there's ten stars, right? That's just their design. But it is kind of deceptive, unless you were perceptive. Mashville, that's the recipe. I said it has to be minimum 51% corn. It's mostly in the 70s. But every distillery, every label has their own Mashville. And some of them are the same, but they vary these things for their particular expression of their bourbon. 70% corn is common. Then that may have a secondary grain of rye, say 20%. And then it may have a tertiary grain of barley. Well, they're all going to have barley in. Barley may be 10%, so there's your 100%. Or it may be 75% corn and 20% of rye, and then 5% barley, or how th these jump around determining the flavor profile of the distillery one. Now, some bourbons use more rye than others. Bullet, I was talking to somebody about bullet earlier. Bullet is what's called a high rye bourbon. Instead of the 10, 15% or so as typical, I think they have 28%. Yes. 68% corn, 28% rye, 4% barley. That's a high rye bourbon. Now there's another thing to know. You don't have to use rye as a secondary grain. You can use wheat. And there are wheated bourbons. Rye bourbons tend to be spicier, peppery, uh, uh, have a little bite to them, more piquant. <coughs> Weeded bourbons are softer, smoother, sweeter. Some people like one, some people like the other. I like them both, but they're different. <laughs> you just have to sample. You have to practice. What do you like? And know what you're getting and compare it with something else. You know. uh, these same rules apply to rye whiskey and wheat whiskey. You know, the recipe has to be predominantly 
the name of the whiskey. Uh, this now is something to consider, Burnham Wheat Whiskey. This is not a bourbon, it's a wheat whiskey. Whereas Weller's is a bourbon that is a weeded bourbon. You get it? Wheat is the secondary grain here. Wheat is the dominant grain here. So it's a wheat whiskey. This is a bourbon with secondary grain of wheat. Here's a rye. Again, dominant grain is rye. It's not a rye bourbon. It is a rye whiskey. Things to think about. Why do we use barley in the making of these whiskeys? Well, this is always the tertiary <coughs> grain in, in bourbon. And it's because it has enzymes that are very useful. You have to malt the barley, which means you germinate it. Spread out on a floor in the old fashioned way. Spread out on a floor, sprinkled with water, it gets starting to sprout. You then add heat that stops the sprouting process. <clears throat> but what you've done is release the uh, hydrological enzymes that will break down the starch that's in all these grains, corn, rye, wheat, barley, their starch is converted by the enzymes in the barley into sugars. You know, the starch is a long molecule, sugar is broken up bits of that. So the sugars are what the yeast eats to make ethanol. Sugar is the fuel the food of the yeast, and the yeast converts that sugar into ethanol, so that's why you do that. Now, if you like single malted scotch, and a lot of people do, there's one, the Glen Morangi, single malt, that's 100% barley. So scotch, a lot of scotch is 100% barley. Here is a blended scotch, which means some of the whiskey in there would, could be made from corn or rye or wheat and some from barley. Blend it together, you get this blended scotch. Um, Johnny Walker's the blended scotch. A lot of people like that. Uh, I put this in here because it's got a cool story. See these little monkeys here? It's called monkey shoulder for a reason. The, this goes back to Scotland in that the laying of this barley on the uh, ground, and it's also smoked with peat from the moors of Scotland. It gives a kind of a smoky flavor. Well. The distillery employee is walking around with a large paddle, like an oar of a boat, paddle. And he's turning this over and over to expose all the surfaces to this uh, smoke from burning of the peat. He gets a repetitive stress injury, you know, like doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It's hurting his shoulder. And the colloquial name of that is monkey shoulder. Taste Somebody on Jeopardy ever asked. <laughs> Another important feature of Kentucky as the dominant bourbon state is their water supply. The, Kentucky is underlain by a limestone karst, calcium carbonate, that as the water percolates down through it, sort of filters it out, it removes iron. Iron is the enemy of bourbon. You don't want any iron in there, it turns black and putrid. Uh, Calcium carbonate is necessary for the yeast. The magnesium in the limestone is good for the yeast. Um, water is essential and very important in the ultimate product. So you get your grain from a farm, hopefully close to the distillery. This is the farm right across the street from my house in Ohio. A, a neighbor does that. So I walked over and took the picture and used it in the book. You get the grain, you bring it to the distillery, it's inspected, shown to be free and clean and healthy and so forth. You then mill it, you grind it up. So you're making a, like a gruel, a, a powder basically. You then put that in the cooker with water and boil it, like you're making oatmeal. And you do that at a, you know, a boiling temperature. You then let it cool a little bit, you add the milled up rye. When that cooks for another, say, 10 minutes, you let it drop down to like 145, and then you add the ground up barley. You cook it a little bit more. Then the interesting thing is, you take this mash that you had put in the spill in your last run of bourbon making, 
put it back into the cooker. That's called the setback, or the back set. And when you do that, you're using a process called sour mash. Almost all bourbon is a sour mash. The sour mash is this used up mash that you've already run through the still. You're putting it back in the cooker. That recycles the water and whatever yeast is still alive. And it, it's a, not only a conservation measure, but it helps keep every batch the same. Your sour mash should be the same from batch to batch to batch to batch because the setback always is put back into the next cycle. Not all whiskeys are sour mash. Here's a, a Stranahan's Colorado whiskey is a sweet mash. They do not use that process. Therefore, every batch of, of whiskey that they make and bottle is different from the batch they're going to make tomorrow and the batch they made yesterday. And that's their choice to make it that way. Fermentation is the next step after you've done the cooking and added the setback. <coughs> Fermentation is a chemical breakdown of substances by yeast. <coughs> Sugars are converted to ethanol. Other waste products are carbon dioxide and heat. So if you put your finger in this huge uh, cypress wood vat of uh, 7,000 gallons or whatever of this gruel that you heat it, you can uh, taste it. It tastes like a cereal without any you know, real sweetness to it, but a, a cereal you'd make for breakfast. It's not objectionable. This is kept there, fermentation goes on. You see the bubbles, those are bubbles all over that surface, it's bubbling up, and it smells kind of nice too. And what's happening is that the yeast is eating the sugar, and they're gonna do this until they run out of sugar. Takes about three days at the usual temperature, under 90 degrees or so. Yeast are very finicky. You gotta keep them happy with their temperature. Too high, they'll die off. Too low, they'll die off. 90 degrees is about right. They make their ethanol over about a three-day period, and they've then created what is called distiller's beer. And that's about 8%. You know, it's, in beer making, you're done. In whiskey making, you now have to go further. So, let's go further. Distillation. It's a way of separating mixtures of liquids by boiling. So ethanol has a lower boiling point than water, obviously, and you need to do a procedure to separate the water and the ethanol. Two types of stills. There are column stills, as these are here, and they're very tall. Some of them are six, seven stories, and they can be enormous. Others are smaller. Uh, each of these little portholes in here has a panel in there with, with uh, perforations. What you do is you take this mesh, drop it in up at the top. You take steam, put it in at the bottom. This drizzles down, and the alcohol in this drizzling mesh is volatilized by the steam as it boils it off, sends it up a condenser as a gas, and then when it gets far enough away from the, the tube, its temperature drops and you get a liquid. That's the liquid that you've distilled off. You've removed all of everything that was in that mash. So that's the first step of distillation. The other kind of distillation is pot stills. The other that we just showed is a continuous still. You can keep that going over and over and over. All you gotta do is keep putting more mash in the top. <coughs> this, you stop it when you've used up what you put in. And you gotta clean it out, fill it up, and start it again. These pot stills, these are from Woodford Reserve. That's the only American distillery that uses pot stills to make bourbon. All the rest use continuous stills for the most part. Now, this bottle is my favorite. This is a Willet, named after the family Willet, whose crest has this little Willet bird that runs around our beaches. Yeah, I think it's the most beautiful bottle in bourbondom. It's, it's obviously shaped like a pot still. How cool is that? There are three of these big stills in the Woodford Reserve. Uh, Scotch and Irish are all made with pot stills. Bourbon is primarily made with the bigger, tall, continuous still. 
Now here shows a column still and a pot still together. This is at the demonstration uh, distillery of Jim Beam. There's a couple things going on here. Here's the column still. So you get the distillate. It goes to the pot still, our doubler. Call the doubler because it's a double distillation process. It's distilled again. So what you get off the column still, say maybe is 125 proof, what you get off the pot still is about 135 proof. You've removed more impurities and you've increased the alcohol content. How do you know what to keep when this is bubbling away? These little things are called spirit safes, and you have a hydrometer in there. The first 5% of what comes off in the distillation is known as the heads. And you measure that by the, the uh, hydrometer, which tells you the density, which tells you what's in it, and so forth, basically. The heads, nasty stuff. You don't want it in there. Uh, methanol, which is wood alcohol, that's what killed a lot of people during Prohibition. They weren't careful of what they're doing. Methanol got in the end result, and it kills you, or blinds you. Um, acetone, which is nail polish remover, you don't want that in your bourbon. Those are the heads. You take it out and recycle it or dump it. The middle section is called the hearts. This is the good stuff. That's what comes off after the 5% of heads. You keep this. And that's what goes then to the second distillation. That's also called low wine. It's the best part of the distillate. This is what you want. Then when you've done with the low wine at a certain point in your measuring, you switch a valve. The next stuff that comes off is the tails. You don't want that either. You'll either send that back for more distillation to remove more impurities, or you use it in uh, you know, industrial solvents or whatever you want. But you don't want it in your bourbon. You want the hearts. Here's a barrel that's been charred. All bourbon barrels are charred. There are three, four degrees of charring, one, two, three, and four. And that has to do with the time you expose the barrel to the flame. Only 55 seconds gives you the highest char. Mm -hmm. This barrel is called alligator char. As you can see how scaly it looks, it's like an alligator. <laughs> this breaks up the wood. It acts like activated charcoal and things move in. Nasty stuff is uh, filtered out like in your aquarium filter. You know? And it also helps the whiskey penetrate the wood. Very important. Different distilleries use different chars. Most use chars three and four. Here we're uh, charring the barrel. This is in the um, International Stave Company's <coughs> Cooperage in Kentucky. I highly recommend this one as a tour. When you go on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail and see three or four of these distillers, you want to go to International Stave Company. It's near Maker's Mark. So you can do two distilleries a day. You want to spend maybe a long weekend. Three days you can hit six distilleries in the Stave Company. Come back the next year and do all the ones you missed. It, it, it's a lifelong <laughs> learning. It, it's so much fun. And this is how I got started. The more I did, the more I wanted to know. And then I took courses from the master distiller at Woodford. And then I took a, a bourbon certification course and you know at Moonshine University. That's a real place. <laughs> it sounds silly, but they are the the educational institution that trains those in the distillery industry. People who run bars, bartenders, whiskey sellers. It's an educational process to make people more informed. So these wooden things are called ricks. And this is a rick house where the barrels are stored, also called a warehouse or a rack house. Note the rivets on the barrel. Next time you go to Home Depot and they're selling half barrels for your garden planting, Look at the rivets and see what you see. If it says KY or MO, that's the Kentucky or Missouri Cooperage of International State Company. Anybody know that before this? I mean, this, this, this is why I wrote the book. I can't read the line. <laughs> B, Brown Foreman, huge 
company is the owner of Jack Daniels, uh, Woodford Reserve, and a bunch of other labels. They, are, they make their own barrels, so there's a B on it. This is a typical Rick house where the bourbon is aged. Aging is an extremely important part of the product. Most brick houses are multi-story. Only four roses does a single story brick house. Now, obviously, there's a reason for that. Why is that? Most of the distilleries want the temperature differential from bottom to top. In a nine story brick house, that may be 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Cool at the bottom, high at the top, as you know, and it's it. Four Roses wants the consistency of the same temperature throughout all their barrels. These big rick houses may hold 200,000, 20,000 barrels, a million gallons, wall-to-wall -wall barrels. And that's a typical rick of three barrels in a row. That's the usual method. I love going through these rick houses. You can smell what's called the angel's share. The angels are getting their sip <laughs> as it evaporates. It's just all throughout the warehouse, wherever you go. You don't dare light a match. <laughs> Very fires and distilleries are horrible things. A lot of waste. Um, angel share goes up into smoke, so to speak, into the air. Because in, in warm temperatures, the liquid expands moves into the wood. There are wood sugars and caramels and things as part of oak. That's just there, the chemicals in the wood. Ethanol is an organic solvent, so it dissolves these sweeter molecules, brings them back into the liquid when it contracts. And then in the cool temperatures, or in summer, winter, or night and day, you get this constant moving in and out of the barrel. That's what the barrel is doing. That is the aging process. <clears throat> it's the barrel that gives you 100% of the color of bourbon. Now, Jim Beam Ghost, just very slightly yellow, that's aged in a used barrel, because it's already been used up, the color is off. You just, it's one year in the used barrel, you get this. Tastes very different than four-year-old Jim Beam which is a little different than the double-aged Jim Beam Black. They have all the same mash bill. The difference there is the aging. Um, Jim Beam Black is, a, is maybe a, a half a notch above Jim Beam in terms of uh, what whiskey experts seem to like. They're both good whiskey. If I give this a 2, I give this a, a 2.5, that sort of thing, in a, in a rating. Here's a cross-section of a barrel stay. The red layer here, that's where the magic happens. Air moves into the wood. It helps oxidize some of these organic compounds and converts them into aromatic fruity esters. These also have their own taste. You may detect a flowery note or a fruity note in your bourbon. That's one of the esters that is made in the barrel. I tend to prefer, and this is my own personal taste, I like bourbon in the vicinity of, of 8 to 12 years. To me, that's the sweet spot. It's old enough to have a lot of these sugars and caramels and cinnamon and vanillas from the woods in the flavor. It's not so old that it tastes like you're chewing on a piece of wood. You know, a lot of people like that highly woody taste. Those are in more expensive bourbons that have been held for so many years, there's hardly anything left. Yeah. Time is an ingredient. That's sort of the take-home message. You know, it's a matter of your own taste. Where you see three pot stills, that's the symbol of Woodford Reserve because that's how they make their bourbon. High up in the rickhouse, it's hot and dry. The proof may increase from 125 you put in the barrel up to 145 or so because water is leaving the barrel differentially compared to the alcohol. Get rid of the water, the more alcohol remains, the proof goes up. The opposite happens at the bottom of the rickhouse. It's cool and damp. This forces more alcohol out than water, the proof goes down. This is happening in the rickhouse. 
There's a nine-story rickhouse, and most distillers, like Jim Bean, do a cross-section. So here's the, this is represented by that cross-section. All those dots are barrels. You know, that goes on for a long distance, there are 20,000 of those barrels. What the master distiller will do <coughs> is take the barrel, say from the top left, as we would say that, you know, the certain side, the south side of the building or whatever, from the top south, down to the bottom north, and the reciprocal on the other side, and then you blend them, because each of these is getting something different happening to it. The temperature it's under, the way it's oxidized, it's different in every location. Blend them together, this gives you the consistency that you can turn out, you know, Knob Creek the same way decade after decade after decade. It promotes consistency. However, a good dis master distiller will know in his rickhouse there's a special spot you know, indicated like that. Somehow there's magic happening there, a little <laughs> different than in other places. They will keep those barrels out and use them either for a single batch, meaning the one, one barrel fills the bottles, and another one barrel fills the next bottle. Each bottling is from one barrel. They don't mix. That's called a single barrel, and you're going to pay more for that. If they mingle several barrels, but not a whole lot, that's called a small batch. And that's a relative term. A small batch to a, a little distillery like Willet <coughs> might be 20 barrels. A small batch to Jim Beam will be 200 or so. But it comes from a special spot, and of course they charge you. Happy Van Winkle, it's a bourbon that everybody wants and nobody will ever get or find. It's 23 years old, never hits the liquor stores. Technically, the list price, $250. Realistically, you wouldn't walk away for less than three, four $4,000 to buy that bottle. I saw one down uh, in Sarasota for about 3500 um, You just can't get them. They never make it to the liquor store. Industrial somehow snatched them up and put them on the internet. It's highly illegal, but that's what happened. Um, here's one year of aging. You've lost that much, about 10%. Four years of aging, like Jim Beam White Label, you've lost that much. So instead of the 53 gallons of the barrel, you now have 41. Here is nine years, which is Knob Creek. You're down to uh, 32 gallons. Obviously, the longer you keep it in the wood, the less you get out when you bottle it. Therefore, the higher price. Happy Van Winkle at 23 years. There's 14 gallons out of the 53 you started. <laughs> and I should point this out. You've probably heard of Angel's Envy. It's a nice bird. They're using that name from the angel's supply that's going on in the, in the rickhouse, the angel share. This is angel envy. And little wings on the back of the bottle. <laughs> the term barrel strength you may see on the label of your bourbon, like uh, Booker's here. This is barrel strength, and it's like 127% uh, alcohol or proof, which is over 60% alcohol. You know, in the early days of COVID, you know how the, you couldn't find Purell. Purell disappeared from shelves. You're paying a fortune for Purell. I did a calculation. I could use Booker's, which is like $75 a bottle, instead of Purell, and it would kill the virus on your skin. <laughs> the CDC says to be a hand sanitizer, you have to be 60% alcohol, which is 120 proof. This is over that. So it, it just shows what an outrageous piece of life we've lived through, where a high premium in bourbon is cheaper than a hand sanitizer. <laughs> Single barrel, that's a, a term you like to find. Here it is. So this is from the special spot in the Four Roses Rick House. 
Uh, this is bottled in bun. That's another good thing to see on your label. Doesn't mean you're going to like it better, that it's better than another bourbon, but it is sort of reassurance you're getting a quality product. Maybe you don't like the taste of that quality product, but it has to be uh, the bourbon distilled in a single season by the same distillery bottled at 100 proof. All bottled in bond is 100 proof, and it must be kept in a government bonded warehouse for a minimum of four years. So that's bottled in bond. Everybody has to play by those rules. Well, how come all these bourbons all taste different? That's what I found phenomenal when I, you know, I kept trying this one and that one. How is this possible? It's all corn and rye, and, you know, why is it all different? Because of all these variables, and if you want to do the mathematics of this, you can take each one of these to the next power and so forth and then figure out that it's almost an infinite amount of variety. Uh, the mash bill we've been through, and it's variable, that has an effect on the taste. The yeast strain, the distillers are very, very protective of their yeast. That's their livelihood. Uh, and each type is different and does something different. The length and the temperature of fermentation. That controls certain products that the yeast produce from the, you know, the, the type of alcohol from the sugar. The barrel characteristics. Is, do you age your barrel stays outside or do you heat them in an oven? Do you age them for six months or a year and a half? Uh, you know, all these things. Do you take a mature tree, a 100-year-old tree, or do you take it from a 50-year-old tree? You take it from the bottom of the trunk or the midsection. All of this has something to do, and there are experts who study this. That's what's so remarkable. You know, as an academic, we have so many specialties. Mm -hmm. I, I work on freshwater fish, not marine fish, although I have done marine things. I work on freshwater fish of Australia, not the whole world, but I've been in other places. We all special. Then I work on a certain family of fish that's only found in Australia. And there are only two members of this family. You know, we all specialize. There are bourbon specialists and everything. The entry proof that you put it into the barrel. Can't put it in higher than 125. But you put it in lower, and some places do. The barrel position in the Rick House we've talked about, and the time in the Rick. See all these Florida pictures? This is my backyard here. <laughs> this, this is my deck at home in Ohio. All the white background. Is, and, uh, you drive by a 201 35th Street, the blue building. That, that's my place. Here's a good summary of everything I've just said. You know, page or batch four that I started off with the, with the flag. Dash 54, those are the two important pages you need to commit to memory. And we'll have a test on that next uh, meeting. <laughs> so, you grow the grain near the distillery if possible. So it has a sharp trip. So the, the corn comes in, the rye comes in, and the wheat, barley, whatever. You then inspect it and grind it up, pass it through a mill. You get this floury substance. That goes into the cooker at various temperatures and get it all together. And this is where the setback comes. The stuff you put in at the top and trickles down, you pipe some of that, about a third of that back, into the uh, cooker. That's your setback. And you do that continually for years. You know, this is how the industrial bourbon is made. What happens to the other two thirds? That is dried out, the liquid is gone. Well, what is it? It's corn, it's rye, it's wheat. It's, that's fabulous food for cows and pigs. It's sold as feed. No waste there. So here is a fermentation going on. The yeast is doing its thing. You then take this product that now has a lot of alcohol in it, carbon dioxide, heat is generated, you, and this is done with piping and valves and that, you put that in the top up here. 
it trickles down through those perforated partitions, the whole length of this. You put steam in here. The steam volatilizes that alcohol past its boiling point. It goes up here as a gas and then condenses into a liquid. That's the low wine, roughly 125 proof. You take that low wine and put it in the doubler for its second distillation. That then, same principle, is condensed. By then, it's 135 proof. Mm -hmm. That is saved until you have enough of it to put in the barrel. It's then barreled at no more than 125 proof. So you have to add water to get it down to 125 proof. Put it in the barrel, and you wait. You may wait years. You have to wait years if you want something really good. So you can't just ring up to the distillery and say, hey, I'm on my way over. Make me some of this 10-year-old bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> Come back in 10 years, and it'll be right. <laughs> Why do we use the term proof? That's an interesting concept. It goes back to the British Navy, and the sailors got a rum ration as part of their pay. Well, they wanted to make sure the quartermaster wasn't diluting their rum and keeping it for himself by adding water to it. So they would take a sample of this rum, put like a handful of gunpowder in it, set a match to it. If it did something like that, they had proof it was good. It was the good stuff. So I wanted to do that for the book, just to learn and to see how I could do it. And I thought about it a lot. And the first thing I had to do was buy gunpowder. How do you do that? You know, I'm not a gunpowder. No, I had to go into one of these places that you have nightmares about it. Because AR-15s all over the wall and all these guys <laughs> there with their camos and all kind of I want some gunpowder. They said, what? What do you want it for? And I signed my life away with all these farms to the federal government. And you can only buy a pound. Well, is that how much I need? I don't know how much I need. So I wanted to duplicate this, but I didn't want to blow my nose off on the camera or anything else. So I weighed out a gram on my laboratory scale, a gram of gunpowder, thinking, well, that a gram, there's 454 grams in a pound. I had 454 grams. I'm going to use one of these grams to see if I can get this reaction. I put it in a, a, a spoon from the Dollar Tree or something that I didn't care about. My neighbor, this is on my deck in Ohio, my neighbor is standing there with this little clicker for a barbecue lighter, you know, a long, long tube, you click, 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 lights the click. And I have my, my expensive Nikon camera here on motor drive, because I, I just don't know what I'm really doing in the autofocus. I said, okay, go, and I push the button. I'm shooting off 16 frames a second or something. And we get this wonderful picture. It, it, it worked. That's proof with Wild Turkey 101. <laughs> it works. Now here, if you want to start a bar fight, we can do that here. It's Jack Daniels bourbon. Yeah. Everybody has an opinion. And I'm going to give you the unequivocal answer that's indisputable. Yes and no. <laughs> you can't accuse me of being wishy -washy. For all practical purposes, it's a bourbon. There's nothing about the manufacture of Jack that is not bourbon. They do it the same way, use the same thing, Corn, the same mash bill, the whole deal, bourbon. But the owners, Brown and Foreman, they don't want to call it bourbon. They've created their own marketing niche called the Tennessee Whiskey. This isn't bourbon, we're a Tennessee Whiskey. So that's how they market it. You can call it bourbon if you want, they don't. Uh, there is a slight uh, thing they do, but a lot of bourbons do too, that nobody bothers to talk about. And they filter it through of sugar maple charcoal. It might be a big, long 10-foot collar that you pour Jack into before you put it in the barrel. What that does is all that charcoal uh, removes a lot of the congeners that would otherwise show up. You know, two schools of thought on that. Some, that's why some people really like Jack and say it's the best thing there is. 
because it's soft and sweet and smooth. So others will say, geez, there's no flavor to this. They took it all out when they filtered it through the charcoal. <laughs> so, you know, to each his own. But it's the largest selling whiskey there is. And the, the only other big selling Tennessee whiskey is George Dickel. For every bottle of Dickel sold, a hundred bottles of Jack are sold. So even though it's number two, it's quite a distance. <laughs> Read the label. Lots of people like seven. They, they are your cocktail. Seven and seven. So that's a shot of uh, Seagram seven and seven up. What are you getting with Seagram seven? Read the bloody label. <laughs> 75% grain neutral spirit. That's vodka. 75% vodka and 25% whiskey. So, you know, it's called American whiskey. They can't call it bourbon because it's mostly vodka. Now, 10 high, it's called a bourbon with a blend of bourbon. What that is, you read the neck label here. 51% straight whiskey, which is a good thing. 49% vodka, or grain neutral spirit. So it's a little different take on it, but these are both very inexpensive, bottom shelf products. I don't claim to tell you what to drink, but I get asked it every time I show up with my book. So th these are not ironclad recommendations. They're things I like. You may not, you may hate them. Inexpensive. Buffalo Trace, Elijah Craig, uh, Evan Williams, uh, single barrel. There's a lot, the, the word expression is used for different forms of the same brand. There's lots of Evan Williams. This is single barrel. Each of these is about $30. You won't find that big red 12 anymore on Elijah Craig. They can't make it fast enough. So they had to take the length of the 12 off, even though they tried to keep the flavor profile the same by adding some whiskey that's probably older than 12 to other younger whiskeys to get what they were trying to duplicate. But if they do that and use four-year-old whiskey, they have to put a four on the label and they're not going to do that. <coughs> you want to spend twice as much <coughs> and get a premium, these guys are good. Blanton's is one of my favorites. If I ever see it, I buy it. I've got a couple in reserve in my liquor cabinet, but I buy it whenever I see it. Uh, it's really good in my, to my palate. Uh, Will it? This is um, fairly available. This is relatively common. Walgreens has it all the time. It's uh, Woodford Reserve Double Oak. In other words, it's Woodford Reserve taken out of the new charred oak barrel and put in a second new charred oak barrel. So you haven't violated anything about bourbon, but it gives it a whole new taste. Keep it in there another nine months or a year. You got a totally different product than you put in there in the first place. And it's a premium price, and it's very oaky. I really like it. Uh, here are whiskeys that are not bourbon. High West uh, is a Colorado distillery of a really neat place and stuff they make. This is called Campfire. It's a blend of scotch, bourbon, and rye. And Campfire is a good name because it has the, that smoky flavor of the scotch. Like you were sitting around a campfire. You know? yeah, it's very good. Um, in my opinion, Stranahan's is a Colorado whiskey that is a sweet match. And it's called Colorado. And they made it that shape and had that long uh, cap, which is a cup, because it fits in your saddle bag and you can grab it quickly. Uh, there's a story behind all this stuff. Whether it's true or not, very hard. <laughs> Yippee ki <-yay. laughs> An expression of cowboy happiness. Uh, if you want to Google it, Google Bruce Willis and uh, uh, Die Hard. He uses that there in a few places, so it, it has, they're, they're having a go. If you know the meaning, good. If not, just call it Yippie Kaye Mabo. <laughs> Here is Rithnar, which is a very old label of rye whiskey. 
and so is Yippee Kaye. These are both rise, which I like. Who owns what? I won't go through all this, but it's in the back of the book, and you can look up and see all the bean brands that you know so well, like uh, Baker's and Basil Hayden and Booker's and Jim Beam and Maker's Mark. They're all owned by Japanese companies. Bean Centauri owns all of that. Uh, Diageo is from the United Kingdom. They own Bowen and Harper's and so forth. Uh, Campari, Italian company, owns Wild Turkey and so forth. But Brown Foreman is an American company. Sazerac, or Buffalo Trace, so an American company. Heaven Hill, a big family-owned thing. Go visit these places. It's just amazing. Here's a quick look at a building in each distillery. They're like college campuses. They're beautiful. And they're old. Many of them are on the historic record. And definitely worth the trip. Some of them are industrial looking because they're making this industrial alcohol, basically. Here's a map of the Bourbon Trail. You can get a big one off of the internet. But um, you go to Bardstown, um, get a motel, spend three or four days, drive an hour in north, south, east, west. You'll hit all these distilleries. You can do maybe one in the morning, one in the evening. Go back to your motel. And of course, you shop while you're there and buy bourbon and things. Next day, you go to another direction. You go to International State Company. You do this three or four times. You take, of course, you sample where you go. <laughs> <laughs> and on one of my trips, I noticed there was an Amish couple there. I thought that was funny as could be. <laughs> my neighborhood is full of Amish, and I know a lot about them. And, you know, they're not, they're not everything you think. <laughs> and I was kidding one of my neighbors about that. He said, yeah, you don't know what goes on behind the barn door. <laughs> <laughs> this is my library. I have over 5,000 books. And now my bourbons are starting to metastasize over my entire collection. And it's on the floor now. My wife won't go in there to vacuum. I've got bourbon bottles there. This trip, I'm, I'm bringing home at least 12 bottles of something that I couldn't find in Ohio. And it, all this is a, is a problem. But you write a book about bourbon. Yeah, it is. Mark Twain, too much of anything is bad, but too much good whiskey, barely enough. <laughs> my book is over here I sell it for $25 I'll sign it to you or if you don't have the money now and you want to get it go to Amazon they sell it for $27 and it's generally available on Amazon all the time but I have 22 copies with me and I'm happy to sign it if you really like a person not only give them my book, but give them a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> and here's Blanton's. Let me tell you a quick story about Blanton's. People who love it don't even know. Each cork has a jockey in the position of the Kentucky Derby. But each one is in a different pose. At the end, he's sitting up with his hands up. Uh, at other points, he's hunkered down. In the start of the race, he's sort of half upright. And there's a letter at the back foot of each heart. Wouldn't you know, it spells out Blanton's. There are eight of them. So you have to buy all eight, collect all eight, which I have done and drunk. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture in my book. I got a barrel stake and drilled holes, eight positions equal distance. And I stuck these horses in running the race. And it's in my book. I had to do it. <laughs> Okay, well that, that's exactly 60 minutes. I rehearsed this and I know what it's going to be. So thank you for your attention.